We've done two of the three legendary birds and they could not be more different. On one hand, you have Zapdos. It starts with Drill Peck, it gets an early Thunderbolt from Surge, and that really sets an early tone that resulted in a dominant run with very few hiccups that landed it near the top of the A tier. Moltres, on the other hand, is a prime example of Game Freak really doing a Pokemon dirty. Now, when you combine the already weak fire typing and flying along with subpar starting moves and a little teeny tiny baby TM learn set, you end up with something near the bottom of the A tier, which is pretty embarrassing for a legendary that has the stats that Moltres does. Today we'll be doing a very thematic ice top run in December to finish off the trio with Articuno, and my initial hopes for this one was that it would be around Zapdos' time in the A tier, but when I got done optimizing and polishing this one, the results really surprised me, so if you want a really refined run, stick around to the end for this one. And before we begin, I'd like to just quickly say that I do solo run content often and if that is of interest to you consider subscribing to be kept up to date likes and comments really go a long way to help channels grow so whether you are a new viewer or a returning subscriber like christopher russo just scroll down take a second and type in ice chicken and it would be much appreciated so with that out of the way sit back relax grab yourself a soda pop or i guess i should say icy with this one and let's just end the year with a great run we don't need to go over articuno's base stats they're really good it's legendary they're sufficient for pretty much anything that you want to do but the main thing here is the learn set it's very sparse it doesn't learn a whole lot but the main thing to take note of is ice beam it's a 95 base power stab move it's very strong and we're going to be relying on it heavily throughout the game in fact i would say that maximizing your ice beam usage is the key to this run and as for the start of the game there's not much to say i do the one mandatory bug catcher and then we go straight to Brock, and we really don't need to say much about this one. I don't one-shot the Geodude, but Ice Beam's enough to quickly get past this one, and just like that, we're moving on with probably one of the fastest starts in any run we've ever done. Moving ahead towards Mount Moon, you do have to use Peck here, because I opt not to heal. The less you heal, the better time you can get, so we have to use Peck on these bugs right here. It's not too bad, but you do waste a few turns, but you should have around seven Ice Beams left after Brock, and if you plan it out right, you can just heal at the center right before Mount Moon and we can just skip over it because there's not much in there. There's no extra battles today. And one of the big time saves and optimizations I made was that we will be using fly today so I don't have to catch an early flyer right here. This means that I don't have to waste time and I can just get straight into the action. So while we're going through Mount Moon, I'm going to take this time and we're going to talk about my goal for the run. And after I did a couple of test runs and I really started to polishing things down, trimming the fat I wanted to do as little battles as possible now obviously we're gonna do things that are very beneficial like do the gentleman candy on the SSN but outside of little things like that there's not much extra in this run and my goal was to crunch it all down to do as little as possible to get the maximum amount of time but let's make our way to cerulean and we can start talking about some things in detail real quick I have four ice beams left after Mount Moon, and I immediately go to rival number two before I heal, and with ice beam in hand, sand attack will not be an issue in this run, and that feels pretty good, and overall I'm able to use three of the four ice beams, I use a couple of pecs here and there to finish off opponents, or take out things like the very weak Abra, and it's a very quick battle, it's very easy, even though we are only level 13 going into the fight, most Pokemon would struggle at that level, we've seen it with other slow leveling group Pokemon, but ice is just a really strong topping. Now let's talk about that for a second as we continue on Nugget Bridge. I do have one Ice Beam left. The first trainer has bug Pokemon, so Peck and a, one additional Ice Beam can do some work here. So I continue on before I do my one heal to anchor myself to Cerulean. But Ice has a stigma. It's a pretty weak defensive type. It's weak to a lot of common things. And you often see lists rank it pretty low. But as an offensive type, it's not really resisted by much. And when you start 
off with something that has a base power as high as this. It's very strong, and I know I probably said that too many times already, but having Ice Beam at times makes you feel about as strong as a Pokemon like Mewtwo. Even though you don't have quite as high of a special as it does, it feels very similar in terms of power level. And that was kind of the first takeaway when I started practicing with Articuno. It's just really strong. And you really just want to get the most out of it. So on Nugget Bridge, I use the first elixir as soon as I get it to replenish my power points so that I never have to use Peck any more than I have to so that I'm always using Ice Beam to make things one shots as much as I can and it really helped out to shave off some time because at the end of the game Articuno really doesn't need that many elixirs but that's a long way off for now all you need to know is that I'm constantly looking for ways to keep Ice Beam as the move that I'm using and avoiding using Peck as much as possible and when that's all said and done we can take a look at Misty. And conventional wisdom and other runs might tell you that this one would be rough. You would think that you have to use Peck here, but what's kind of surprising that you wouldn't think until you looked at damage numbers is that Ice Beam does way more damage and you can still freeze these water types. I take out Starmie very swiftly with just two Ice Beams, then we move to the Starmie, and you would think that Bubble Beam critting could be a problem because I don't resist water, but we have a very high special and it doesn't matter. And even though we don't see it here, we have that 10% chance to freeze with Ice Beam. But you can see that even on Starmie, a Pokemon with very high special, we're still doing pretty decent damage, and we get this one down, and it's not even that bad, and this is where I knew that Articuno might have a chance to be something pretty special. After the battle, we get access to Bubble Beam, and it makes Articuno a little bit unique because none of the other legendary birds get access to any moves that are outside their topping, and Bubble Beam's not the best move in the world. It does give you some minor coverage on fire tops, but you really don't need it, and We'll talk about that later, but it is worth noting it's an extra move that gives us 20 extra PP to work with when the situation calls for it. It lessens the load that Ice Beam's already carrying right now, and that's pretty big. Now we can just skip down to the SS Ann, and I do pick up the one optional battle for the run, and it's pretty important because rare candies are just that good. And this is just a good example of Bubble Beam putting in some work. I do accidentally use Peck in the footage, but that's alright. But Bubble Beam with our specials good enough to let us save a couple of Ice Beam here and there and we can just go straight into rival number three and nothing's really changed since rival number two when you have ice beam for the pidgeotto it really helps out a lot dare i say it even trivializes the rival because that status condition is really the only thing that can really make you lose fights with strong pokemon and we don't have to dwell on it we can skip over that and then we can ultimately go straight to surge but it is worth noting that i use an ether before the battle Now I'm highlighting this battle with the battle music just because we're weak to electric types and Surge can really be a problem. He has good AI in Pokemon Red and Blue, but as far as the Voltorb and the Pikachu goes, they are pretty easy one shots and let's just focus on what the problem of this battle always is. And I'm not going to hop this up too much guys, it's Lieutenant Surge, he uses an X speed on the first turn, he gets blasted with an Ice Beam, and then he only uses Thundershock which doesn't do near enough damage, and we take it out and we get another badge. Now, you might be wondering why I even waste the time doing all the theatrics for this battle and it's just because Raichu is a pretty solid Pokemon. He's taken out a lot of my runs and I just want to highlight how dominant Articuno was during this part of the game because when you really think about it, it's only huge weaknesses are electric and fire. And you might be saying, but Matt, what about rock? It's times four week to rock. Guys, we've been playing Pokemon red and blue, sometimes yellow for a long time, a year and a half now. And you guys know better than that. That, there is no rock type damage in Pokemon Red and Blue. We don't have to worry about a thing with that. Why do you guys think Charizard's run was so dominant? Come on. Today we don't have to deep dive into Rock Tunnel, but I will take a look at the first Pokemaniac here. Cubone's nothing. He goes down to a single Bubble Beam, but once again, just like with the Misty example, using a resisted Ice Beam on a Water type does a ton of damage, and it's pretty counterintuitive to how you would think, and this kind of situation just came up a lot, and I think it's worth pointing out 
that even though you think Peck might be the better move to go, the answer is always Ice Beam. Now we can skip it all the way ahead to Celadon, and from there I take on the Rocket Hideout immediately. Giovanni's a pushover, but I do want to say that I am picking up high money items, because even though Articuno's run is dominant, we do need some extra vitamins today to reach some very crucial breakpoints in later fights. After that we pick up Fly, and I do use it. I do believe this is only the second time that we'll be using Fly in our learn set since Moltres, and I guess that says a lot about the state of your move pool. It's pretty shallow when you have to use Fly. Now I would like to make an addendum to something I said in the Moltres video. I said that Pack was a better move because it has the same base power as Fly, but getting to use two moves gives you a better chance of landing a crit if you have a pretty decent crit rate, and we 16.6%, it's pretty good. But I was wrong, very slightly wrong. The way red and blue rounds down numbers, that means if you take a 35 base power move, add stab to it, it's gonna go to 52. But if you take the 70 base power of fly, add stab to it, it's gonna go to 105 effective power. This means that fly does have one more effective power than peck, so it is indeed just a slight bit stronger. And normally you don't worry about defensive type moves in a solo run, offense and speed is the way to go, but I do think that flying up in the air and having that invulnerable turn is really good, especially if you're in a tough battle. It can really buy you some time, save you some HP, but that's enough about that. We've seen rival number four in the background, and we'll be skipping over the rest of Pokemon Tower, but I am grabbing high money items here as well, because I have not made my one Celadon Mart visit just yet. When that's done, I do pick up the final HMs of the run down in the Safari Zone, as well as some extra vitamins and goodies down there. And since we are an Ice-type Pokemon, I do go straight for Erica after that, but before we do our big buy, and there's not much to say here, at this level Ice Beam can just one shot the victory bell consistently, and once that's down, you already know this fight's already over with. I will just like to draw attention one more time. I think Vileplume has a top three sprite in Pokemon Yellow. I think it's very good. I'm actually pretty excited about that run, but like I always say guys, I have 1,000 ideas, and I normally only do about one video a week, so eventually we'll get to that run, but it's easy. Now let's skip to the Celadon buy. I pick up a Poke Doll for Mimic in the future. And the choice of vitamins today are kind of confusing, but we'll get over the significance of it very soon. I buy six proteins and one Carbos. There's no calciums today, and that's because we don't really need any extra special damage. Where things got really dicey and really close in the run was always due to that physical damage, and this really gets us to a couple of breakpoints in the late game, and that one extra Carbos does the same thing, but with speed. So so don't think about it too much right now, but just know that there's no calciums today. It's all proteins. We're maxing out our stat experience in attack, and we need just a little extra boost of speed. Now we are in Silphco. I immediately go to the 10th floor, and the real reason that I wanted to come here now is I want this Carbos, and I want the protein on the 5th floor. If you go and do Koga first, you will be at the point to where you can no longer use a vitamin. You'll be at that 25,600 threshold, and these vitamins will be useful, and if you can't use these vitamins, you are going to lag behind in speed, you're not going to do enough damage in certain fights later in the game, and it's very important to get them now. This is one of the things that I love about solo runs. This kind of strategy is something I picked up from the Rhydon run, and I was able to implement it in a run that was much better, but I was able to get some great uses out of it. Now normally, you would say rival number 5 is really tough, but I know that if I want to get the absolute best run possible, I need to take on rival number 5 now, so that I don't have to do any backtracking. I also use two rare candies right before I fight the Arbok Grunt, before I pick up the card key, before I get the protein. You might think that this is a little random and sporadic, but if you look, my experience was at 4,084 before that, and this is the most efficient, most experience that I can get out of my rare candies for the moment for quite a while. So I get to that level 35 damage rounding threshold, we finish up, and now we can take a look at rival number five. First up is Pidgeot, it's weak to ice, we have a very strong ice beam, it goes down to one single hit. Now the same thing goes for execute, and you might notice that my ice beam power points are getting a little low, and next is Gyarados. So in order to preserve power points here, I have to use fly, and it's worth talking about Gyarados real quick, I don't have a great answer for it this run, but remember it is neutral to ice, so later when we don't have to worry about power points, we can utilize that, but here I just used a few flies, and if you remember using 
getting all those proteins earlier, this is one situation where it helps out pretty good. And after that, we can move on to the Alakazam. And since I'm confident that one Ice Beam is all it will take for Charizard, I do use one here. And this is a situation just like earlier with Starmie, with Slowpoke, where Ice Beam just does more damage, even if it's resisted, or in Alakazam's case, it just has a really high special. I use one, I get trolled just a little bit, I go to use some flies on it, it eventually gets disabled. I do have to take some extra damage here and finish it off with just lowly little bitty peck. But we do get through, we're healthy enough, and even though I don't outspeed the Charizard, I can tank an Ember just fine, and Ice Beam is enough to one-shot it. Now I crit here, I don't think it mattered, but that's the fight, and this felt like a pretty early Rival 5 battle, even though we are pretty much on par with some of his Pokemon's level, but getting this done now means that we have maximized our vitamin usage, and we don't have to backtrack here anymore, and overall, throughout the whole routing process and doing all these runs, this this, probably the most out of everything really set us up very nice looking to go towards that end game. And another reason doing the game in this order saves time is that usually you have to hold off on getting strength. I forget a lot and I bring it up in my videos pretty often. But if you go to Sylph before Koga, that means when you fly down to Fuchsia to take on Koga, you can take a quick detour. You can make one trip in here, get the TM for strength, go ahead and teach it to your Lapras, and you never have to come back here. It's just a really tiny time save and not every Pokemon can do this. It may seem obvious, but a lot of Pokemon find it much easier to take on Koga before you take on rival number five, which is generally one of the harder fights in the game. Once we're in Koga's gym, before we fight any of his trainers, it is time to once again use some early rare candies. And that takes us up to level 42. Now, Sanqui runs, I'd like to just talk about something, kind of a little tangent here. I won't take too much of your time, but these very precise numbers that I know when to use rare candies, when they're gonna help me out the most and how it's going to help my damage ranges in hard fights, that is something that you just cannot get on the Sanqui tool. I have good software, I have good tools to help me know these precise moments. And if you ever wondered if I never elaborated enough, this is why Sanqui runs could never be as good as these runs because I can just be so precise with these runs. Anyway, after that it's time for Koga and let's just take a look at it real quick. And this one's gonna look really easy. I'm pretty much gonna sweep through the fight with no issue. But notice on the sidebar, I do have the TM for Reflect. I didn't get it in this run, but I really thought I did need it because this fight was really tough in practice. And I did have to use lots of rare candies. I used six, if you count the ones back at Sylph all the way to now. I had to be at a pretty high level to guarantee one shots on the coughing and to pretty much alleviate the threat of a wheezing self-destruct or something like that. So even though this looks easy, I'm telling you guys, Guys, this was one of the tougher fights in the game when you're planning out and you're routing So if you are watching a blind run right now You might be watching a lot of resets at Koga and there's a pretty big reason why you saw me go to Silphco and face rival number five first before this after I pick up Mimic from the copycat and we head straight over to Sabrina and this one's just a route This is where proteins kind of came in handy, but it's not really the main reason we use it on the Kadabra The Venomoth and the Alakazam and I use Ice Beam on Mr. Mime I I do get a crit on the Alakazam, but it really doesn't matter too much. This one's just pretty easy. It's kind of a formality. And now we can start taking a look at some of the other challenges of the game. Obviously, this is going to lead us to a very brisk swim down to Cinnabar. And the only thing worth talking about is Blizzard. Now, guys, you're never in your life going to see a Blizzard more powerful than this. With Stab, it has an effective 180 base power. Now, I will say that on the, my test runs, I was picking up PP ups to make it a little more consistent in case I missed, but I did cut those out to save all that time. But needless to say, it's very strong and it's much needed here. And there's something very key that I haven't mentioned yet. We mentioned the fire weakness. Obviously, we're about to go to the fire type gym. We're in here right now. And something that worked against runs like Charizard and Moltres is about to be a very huge benefit to Articuno. So after a little bit of Tombstoner, brother, let's go into a little bit of detail with Blaine.
And guys, the one huge thing here that's going to catapult Articuno to very high levels at the end of the run is the simple fact that fire does not resist ice in Generation 1. That means that we do not have to go with Bubble Beam. We can use the big guns when we need to. We can use Ice Beam for the Growlithe and the Ponyta. We can use Blizzard on the Rapidash and the Arcanine. This is something I didn't think of when I was doing my first runs, but it was something that came back to me. If you guys remember in the Moltres run, Lorelai was a knight Nightmare. It wasn't as much so for Charizard, but it was still pretty rough. But now we get to take the flip side of it and we get to use it to our advantage. And I will point out to somebody who's maybe confused, like why don't I just use Bubble Beam because it's super effective? Well, 65 base power, super effective, is 130 effective power, whereas just a neutral stabbed Ice Beam does 142, and it gets even more out of hand when you think about Blizzard. Now, there's not much to say about this fight other than the fact that Ice is not resisted by fire and I've already covered that but I do take a fire blast at the very end if you're wondering if Articuno has the chops to tank a move look at me tank this fire blast very well and this one is done we're down with seven gems there's only one left guys and after the cool trainer with the one Rhyhorn I just level up and that means once again guys it's time to use some more strategic rare candies I use three to get up to level 48 for that nice damage rounding threshold and you don't really need it for G Giovanni, that's not the reason. It's because our experience is at one of the best ranges to use them that it will be for pretty much the rest of the run, and that's why I use the rare candies now. I know I've already covered that, but I feel like it bears repeating just in case anybody's wondering. I like to give you some insight on why I do things the way that I do. But let's just go over Giovanni real quick. What can I really say? I'm an ice type. He's very weak. It's Giovanni in red and blue. It's not quite Bruno levels, but it is what it is. We sweep through this fight very easy. There's not much more to say. Let's just move on to rival number six. Pidgeot is first. Ice Beam. That's all you need to know. Rhyhorn is next. Bubble Beam is good enough to finish it off in one hit as well. Next up is our old pal, Execute. I accidentally go for a Bubble Beam here, but it doesn't matter. It just charges up a Solar Beam for some reason. I don't know why. And we finish it off the next turn. Good job, Execute. Next up is Gyarados, and we're starting to get into those late game problems that we really have to plan for. Now here, I just crit with a neutral blue blizzard and I one shot it. Now normally this would be a two shot, probably use a blizzard into an ice beam, but we can just move on. We can talk about Gyarados later if we need to. As for Alakazam, this is where the bulk of those proteins are for because we really can't do a lot of damage to it with our own special moves even though they are extremely powerful. We need fly here and the one drawback to fly is that turn in between. The invulnerable turn that usually helps out is more of a curse here because if it sets up reflect like it does here, this can turn into a real slog and it does here we waste a little bit of time but ultimately we're at full health at the end of it we take it out we get a crit i would say it's lucky but we have a pretty much one in six chance around there to get it so we can move on to the charizard and there's not much to say we've already covered it fire does not resist ice and since it's flying topping it's actually weak to it so we take it out in a single hit and that's rival number six done and dusted and now only the elite four stands in our way of complete victory and notice that we are really low time right now. We finished rival number six at a sub one hour and 53 minute time, and that is absolutely incredible. As for Victory Road, our bags are full, so I go ahead and I use a rare candy to get up to level 51 because we were gonna have to do that anyway for Lorelei, and I go ahead and I use Mimic to free up some bag space. I replace it with Bubble Beam. Originally, I would just like to talk about this for a second. I was replacing Ice Beam with Mimic, and I was keeping Bubble Beam. I guess I thought that it would be a little bit more helpful on like the onyxes for Bruno, maybe a couple of other situational matchups, but Bubble Beam's just kind of weak. Ice Beam in itself is just a really strong move, and you should hang on to both of them. It's worth doing it, especially if you're trying to save time like me, and you did not pick up PP ups for Blizzard. Ice Beam still has a lot of uses left, and with that said, let's just take a look at the Ice Mirror match against Lorelei. Thank you. 
and it might surprise you that this fight is not very clean. It's actually kind of luck based. I'm not sure how easy it would be to lose, but this fight can be very painful and I experienced a lot of pain in my test runs. The main problem is growl. Obviously you don't want to use a double resisted blizzard or ice beam on the dugong or the cloister. And if you get a turn one growl, it really neuters your fly damage down to next to nothing. And thankfully here it misses a growl on turn one. And really the only thing here, this is kind of one of the only luck based parts of the run, is that I need a fly crit. It's going to use rest, it stays asleep for three turns total. It's going to take you two or three flies, but the problem is that invulnerable turn. So in this footage you're going to see me eventually crit and get it down, but it does take quite a while and it's worth noting that this dugong is quite a hassle. And this is where right here, this battle right here, is where the proteins from earlier come into play because you need every ounce of damage that you can get because you want to ensure that you're not letting this dugong linger around more than it has to. Cloister is next and it's even more of a slog here than the dugong was. The fight lasts even longer. Now there's not much to say for this one. It's not going to drop your attack like dugong but the real thing that really kind of made me mad here was it gets a critical hit five turn spike cannon and it does a lot of damage. I'm getting really low and I haven't mentioned this yet but we're at zero resets and I was getting really worried that this was going to be our very first one but after some persistence I do take it down and now we get to the more consistent side of the fight now you already know with slow bro we have mimic you know what we're gonna do we're gonna take amnesia we're gonna boost our special out of its mind we do take one growl here but at this point in the fight that doesn't matter all that does is boost our special even more and when it's all said and done we are at 720 special and just look at this beautiful blizzard damage that we do on the slow bro and it goes without saying that we can now even with a resisted move we can one shot the jinx and lapras is a bulky little boy but barring a crit we're tanky enough to survive pretty much anything and even though i do get really low that spot cannon from the cloister was kind of worrisome i do take this on the first try and the undefeated streak is still at hand articuno fans rejoice icy is still on the path to victory next up is bruno and i guess that we're neutral to fight attacks but does it really matter I don't really know what to say about this fight so I'm just not gonna say anything it is what it is it's Bruno it's another week in this dominant run did you expect anything less let's look ahead next is Agatha and you might be thinking that I don't have a great way to deal with her ghost and this might be a tough fight and that's a yes or a no for me and this is another product of the proteins from earlier notice how when I use a fly on the first Gengar it's almost exactly half of its health that is very much by design and I eventually use two flies to take it out now the rest of the battle isn't that much of a big deal we don't have to go into it I use blizzard I use ice beam we're taking everything out fairly easy now we get really close to losing this fight on the final Gengar toxic combined with some bad luck means that it gets a ton of procs on me and it starts to really rack up the damage even though I was at full health going into this one so when it's all said and done I land the final lethal fly at only 22 HP where I would assuredly have died next turn and we once again are still undefeated we're moving on to Lance and for this fight there is only one point of contention and that is the Gyarados we've talked about this time and time again and I've mentioned before that blizzard into an ice beam is usually all that it takes now here I don't take any crits it's just a single dragon rage and I'm able to finish it off now you could argue that I should open up with blizzard I open up with ice beam here it's a tiny mistake I was taking reflect for this fight as well but it's just not needed the chances that he'll use a move and crit on it and one shot you I'm willing to take the risk if it saves me some time in the long run as for the rest of the fight there's not much to say everything's weak to ice and I just quickly mow everything down and now we're at one fight we're at sub two hour and ten minutes with one fight left this run is amazing surely nothing will let us down right and before we dive in I have one rare candy left left I use it, I get up to level 55, and guys, agility is here to save the day. It may not look like much, but it is a badge boosting move. It's very crucial, and now, let's just take a look at the champion and see if Articuno can finish off this extremely dominant run right here, right now.
Pidgeot is first, it's weak to ice, but first things first, I need to set up agility. I need to set up all of them. Now the only thing that really happens is that it mirror moves agility like a ton. It's a little bit weird, it's a little bit awkward. We're staring each other in the eye. Eventually, I do take it out. Now three agility setup was absolutely key here. It does a couple of things for this fight that are very important. And the first thing is that it puts Alakazam in a guaranteed one hit range of fly, barring that it doesn't set up reflect it doesn't here we're able to take it out very quick we can move on to the ride on and we really don't need to say anything about this guy he's weak to ice his special is like negative six so we could just take it out very easy and move on the second very key thing about three agilities is it also puts executor in a one shot range from a blizzard and blizzard only and we take it down we don't have to worry about hypnosis and anything stalling out this battle and this was probably the most important part about agility right here as for Gyarados, it is not good enough to one-shot it. We do really heavy damage, but we do tank a Hyper Beam here. It doesn't crit. It's pretty impressive how well we tank it, and we finish it off on the next turn. It's not too bad. We do level up after, and you might be wondering if that's a problem on the Fire-type Charizard that's coming in. And the answer to that is no. A 180 effective base power Blizzard is enough to annihilate this Lizard and take the run. We finish it off in style. And that's it guys, Articuno has done it. And if you're watching the video right now, you see my time, you see the resets. Even as I'm sitting down to do the voiceover, I'm really conflicted on what I wanna do with Articuno, but let's just kinda take a look at the stats before we kinda get into anything like that, because this one was kind of a, it was a pretty amazing run, but let's just go over the stats before we talk about it in more detail. Articuno finishes with a level of 56 and zero resets for our second perfect run, but the most important important thing of all is that it finishes with a final time of 2 hours 13 minutes and 21 seconds. That means that this run is almost 3 minutes faster than Mewtwo and it's about 2 hours and 45 seconds faster than the Gengar run that had to sacrifice resets just to get a little cheeky victory over time over Mewtwo. So if you look at this thing head on you would say well it has zero resets there were really no problems in the run and it has the best time so why isn't this Pokemon number 1 and what I have to say to that is it is for now. I think very soon I'm not sure when I'm recording a lot of these videos ahead of time so I can take a vacation Now I'm gonna be back from vacation on my birthday And I think I need to give Mewtwo one more stream a little birthday Mewtwo stream Because I know that Mewtwo can beat this time and you might be thinking it's not fair to give Mewtwo all these extra runs And to that I say that Mewtwo did not have some of the software I had when I did my stream redo I think Mewtwo can do good and I think we all Owe it to Mewtwo to have that software to really let him optimize his playthrough. I think we're going to give it one, maybe two playthroughs, and then we are going to do a times one speed run to see if we can do that stupid sub two hour J Rose run that everybody asked me about. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. For now, for the foreseeable future, for at least a video or two, we're putting Articuno at the number one spot. Now, even though its move pool's shallow, it starts off with Ice Beam and it's extremely dominant throughout. I I only did three runs with this thing. I could do even better if I gave it more and more and more and more runs, but I don't need to. This run is dominant. It far surpassed my expectations, and I don't know if we'll ever see a Generation 1 Pokemon do this good again. I thought this Pokemon was gonna be like two hours, 30 minutes, be about on par with Zapdos, have some struggles by not having really high physical damage, but it turns out that starting with Ice Beam is really, really strong. This one was really fun to route out. I'm very happy. I'm always excited when we get a Pokemon that reaches new heights and surprises me a lot. And I think this might be the biggest surprise yet because this time is phenomenal, guys. And with that out of the way, a special shout out to all my members. We have John Kegler, Wilfredo Smith, Sean Green, Cold Frost Zero, D Downing 2007, with Gua, Tanner 23, TR2G Hipster, Deal, Astrid, Nathan Meadows, Mariah Thompson, Meeves, JWJ, Mutus Dozen, D's Master, Cheesy Speakeasy, Josh Ferment, and Kendall C. Now, it's likely that 
This list has changed a lot. I have recorded a lot of these videos in bulk, and I don't know how far I'm going to get to get ahead in January, but eventually, everything's going to work out like it should. Now, I don't want these videos to go on too long, since this video was so good today, and my retention time has been a little bit lower as of late, I am going to just cut out Mewtwo. It's not worth it. It doesn't do much. If you want it in, you let me know. Comment every time you want Mewtwo, but as for now, I think it takes too much time, and I'm trying really hard to cut out. I don't want to babble at the end, and I know I am. So with that said, that's about all I have for you. If you made it to the end of the video, you're a real one. I appreciate you. And the support that you guys provide is amazing. And I will catch you guys next year, I guess, 2023. Hopefully it's a great year. Hopefully you guys have a positive mindset and we can make some great things happen. I'll see you then. Bye.